Oh. The world of Jurassic Park still holds a lot of mysteries yet untangled by our magnifying glass-wielding fandom. It is part of the charm of the franchise and surely one of the reasons why I became fascinated by the first film as a seven-year-old child. Jurassic Park's marketing, in fact, seemed designed to shroud the film and its world with some level of mystique. So naturally, fans are left with questions the film and its sequels are not inclined to answer. And one of the most interesting questions surrounds the genders of the three surviving Velociraptors at Jurassic Park. Hi, my name is Brian I and welcome back to Jurassic Kingdom and today we're digging into why I think the raptor known as the big one is definitely a female. We can start by examining the role of the big one in the film, followed by breaking down the theory that the big one is actually a male, having undergone the transition from female to male at some point prior to the movie's beginning. We are first acquainted with the big one in the opening of the movie. Despite having been presumably sedated by Robert Muldoon and the park staff before this, the raptor is shown to be unusually agitated and energetic by the time it is delivered via forklift to its new digs. Although we are later told the impetus for this transfer, it is done with exceptional brevity. Muldoon briefly explains, She had them all attacking the fences when the feeders came. In the movie universe, it appears that after the big one usurps the pecking order of the raptor pack, it begins to lead the others to charge the staff, which ultimately lands them in this new jail. The novel provides a little more context. The raptors, as it turned out, were expert Houdinis, managing to escape their electrified fences several times. We can assume this, combined with the big one's subsequent actions, were the primary reasons why the park determined the pack to be, for the time being, unfit for exhibition in the standard park format. While the other animals enjoyed large ranges behind electrified fences, the raptors were not content with that arrangement and were now to be confined in a Spartan utilitarian box. During Jurassic Park's opening scene, the big one is presumably being transferred from that original habitat into this heavily fortified pen designed to ensure that they could not escape ever again. The raptor demonstrates its extreme aggression by overcoming whatever sedation was previously administered and jamming the cage's gate, thereby sending gatekeeper Joffrey, who had been previously on top of the cage, tumbling to the ground. Despite fully charged tasers being used, followed towards the end of the scene with live rounds, the raptor is still able to maul and kill the poor man, prompting the entire plot of the movie to occur. I think it's important to note that Muldoon would have been under strict orders not to use live rounds. John Hammond was apparently very against the euthanasia of any of his animals, as he brushed aside Muldoon's later declaration. They should all be destroyed. Ha ha ha, Robert, Robert Muldoon, my game warden from Kenya. Bit of an alarmist, I'm afraid, but knows more about raptors than anyone. And near the end of Act Two, he seems angrily opposed to the idea of using the lysine contingency. What about the lysine contingency? We could put that into effect. What's that? That is absolutely out of the question. Muldoon would know all about Hammond's loathing to put down his dinosaurs when he orders the security staff to SHOOT! After the tasers fail to deter the raptor. The next we see of the big one, we don't actually see her at all. Dr. Alan Grant learns the park has bred velociraptors during an impromptu visit to the Island Nubler lab, where the guests watch one hatch from an egg. This is an important clue that I will return to soon. He then rushes to see the pen during the big tour. Muldoon gives us a breakdown of the lore. InGen had bred eight raptors for exhibition. It appears that the big one was the youngest of the bunch, as Muldoon explains, We bred eight originally, but when she came in, she took over the pride and killed all but two of the others. This will come into play later as a critical piece of my argument. During this scene, Muldoon elaborates on the raptors as a whole, but make sure to emphasize that these characteristics of the raptors, their speed, their aggression, their intelligence, are heightened in the big one. So now we know the big one heads a pack of three, including itself, and that they are so ravenous that they kill and presumably dismember a full-grown steer in moments, and that they are so dangerous that they could not be contained except for in a highly secure, almost military installation. The next piece of the raptor puzzle comes following Grant and the children's encounter with the Brachiosaurus. They come across a hatched clutch of eggs, revealing that at least one species of dinosaur was breeding on the island. It is not overtly stated in the movie, but the tracks we see leading away from the eggs are small versions of the ones we see later in the film leading away from the raptor pen. And it has apparently been confirmed in tie-in sources, meaning that a young pack of raptors were roaming the island at the time of the end of the movie. 
It is not until the third act that the big one is again brought into play. She and her two subordinate raptors, Randy and Kim, so named by the fans in honor of their animators Randall Dutra and Kimberly Blanchett, escape their pen when they realize the power is cut. It could in fact be that Ray Arnold similarly passed by the pen, prompting them to make another attempt on their fencing. However, they came to know they could escape. It took them long enough that Ray Arnold was in the shed by the time they catch up to and kill him. And it appears too that only one of the raptors enters the shed to do so, as two others are waiting outside for Muldoon and Ellie Sattler. Now it is difficult to pin down which of the raptors is the big one, as the production created only two raptor bodysuits to portray three animals. However, we can infer that the big one appears in this scene to be the one that lures Muldoon into the jungle, where one of the subordinates is waiting to catch him unawares. The other subordinate is, of course, in the shed with Ellie. Because only two practical raptors were created for the film, all three raptors are never shown to be in the same place at the same time. So there's always an odd one out. We can assume that odd one out during their next big scene, which takes place in the kitchen, is the raptor in the shed. If we also assume the big one is not the one locked in the freezer by Lex, then she is the one alerted to the possibility of prey in the kitchen by the raptor that killed Muldoon. She's therefore the lone raptor who chases Grant, Ellie, and the kids to the control room and out into the rotunda. She is joined by her last subordinate, which again would have been the one previously encountered in the shed by Ellie, reinforced by the fact that it is Ellie who reacts to the dinosaur's appearance in the rotunda. This newcomer is the one Grant and crew are facing when the Tyrannosaur suddenly lunges into frame to kill it. The last raptor, the one that scars the Rex and is subsequently killed by being bit and thrown into the skeletal display, was the big one. Her story sort of ends right there, unless you believe it was her offspring who now had full roam of the island. Although we can't know for sure that the raptor I selected to name as the big one in each scene is in fact the big one, since the two raptor puppets used in the movie were identical, in following the rules of movie villainy, these are the conclusions I thought best to draw. There are a couple of things that made me hesitate on which animal was which, but this makes the most sense to me. Now on to the theory that the big one was a male raptor. Proponents of this theory point to a few things that make this worthy of examining in detail. Firstly, the name Big One suggests it was larger than the other seven raptors in the original pack. Since most of the male animals that we think of are larger than their female counterparts, this is not a baseless point on its surface. It makes a good deal of sense. Until you realize that while most male mammals are larger than their female counterparts, most of the animal kingdom trends to the opposite. In reptiles, male crocodilians and lizards are larger, where females are larger in snakes and turtles. In birds, males trend larger in most species, but a significant number are the reverse, including most birds of prey. Since science cannot currently confirm whether dinosaurs displayed sexual size dimorphism, this argument is revealed to not be as sturdy as it first appears. Using the sequels as a guide, raptors with tiger striping color schemes are seen, confirmed in behind the scenes and tie-in material to be the males of the species. Proven by the film itself as raptors identical to the ones we see in Jurassic Park are shown to be present on Sorna as well, and these tiger-striped raptors seem to be smaller than the ones we see in Jurassic Park, which indicates to me that simply being larger would actually likely preclude the big one from being a male. Supporters of this theory also point to the big one's aggressive nature. It kills five other raptors in its quest to become the head of the pack, and leads the two remaining raptors to begin attacking the fences when staff came to feed them. This apparently marks a distinctive quality not found in the original set of raptors, because Muldoon goes through the trouble of specifically calling it out when discussing the danger of the raptors in general presented. As we tend to imagine males as the dominant gender in any animal social hierarchy, it's not surprising that some fans came to this conclusion. Again, however, we run afoul of both actual nature and the franchise itself. While reptile species largely lack any true social structures, bird society, especially those in raptors, are often female dominated, even if a lot of species are smaller than their male counterparts. Furthermore, Jurassic Park 3 fully demonstrates the pecking order of the velociraptors, as a single mated female is shown to lead several male raptors. Even in considering that the JP3 raptors are a separate tribe from the Jurassic Park slash Lost World tribes, their social structures are likely similar, if not identical. The idea of the big one being a male is not necessarily a bad one. In fact, it would drive home the entire gender transition subplot if the big one was the one that transitioned to male. But there are a couple other clues that help us debunk the theory outright. Firstly, as discussed in a previous Deep Dig video exploring why Ellie Sattler is so 
underappreciated in the sphere of strong female film characters, Jurassic Park seems to go out of its way to challenge traditional gender norms, casting Ellie as the primary action star and voice of reason, and Alan Grant as a care provider for the children. By the end, it is a woman who restores power to the park, a little girl who boots up the system so they can call in a rescue, and a female Tyrannosaur who saves the main cast from an untimely death at the jaws of the surviving raptors. Yes, the main male characters save the children several times, and yes, following the Rotunda showdown, those characters are then picked up by Hammond and Malcolm. But it doesn't really take away the fact that the big impactful moments are perpetrated specifically by female characters. It makes thematic sense then, too, that the main villain is also a female character, because to imply that the big one transitioned to male makes it seem like only a male character can be a real threat to a female character, because female characters can't also be satisfying antagonists. From the very progressive attitude the filmmakers take towards their female human characters, it's unlikely that they would suddenly cop out by making the main dinosaur villain of the film a male because testosterone or whatever. But going beyond thematic resonance, there's something very important and more concrete in the kernels of narrative given to us by the film. Robert Muldoon says, We bred eight originally, but when she came in, she took over the pride and killed all but two of the others. We don't know how long the raptors were in their original enclosure, but it is heavily implied in this dialogue that the big one is the youngest of the originally bred raptors, and that it did not take long for her to assume control. By the time she was introduced to the enclosure, the other seven raptors seem to have already been an established pack. The implication here is that the big one was already aggressive by the time she joined them, and since we know the animals change sex due to an overabundance of one sex in a given environment, she would be the least likely to have made the transition because she had not been there long enough to do so. The seven other older raptors, having already been in the enclosure with each other, stand the higher chance of being male. In fact, I would posit that the two subordinate raptors are, in fact, the males. Here's why. A more aggressive, larger female raptor joins the pack. It learns that two of them have transitioned to males. Muldoon refers to them as a pride, so we can infer they operate like lions, except with a female leader. That means the males would do the work, as we see in both Lost World and Jurassic Park 3. It also means that the female would want to purify the raptor bloodlines with her own offspring, killing the five other female raptors and destroying any nest she found. We can safely assume then that she missed the one Grant finds or wasn't able to destroy it before she and her subordinates were moved to the pen or the hatchlings are her progeny. Now, the male raptors in the Jurassic Park universe definitely appear different from their female counterparts. Because Grant's theory about tree frog gender reversal, which is true in the universe of the film, is debatable at best in real life, we do not know what the timetable, if any, would be for a change in coloration. So perhaps we cannot rely on this as an accurate measure of what gender the individual raptors were, as they all look like females. Regardless of whether the subordinates are male or female, though, the big one certainly appears to have been a female. Thematically, visually, even logically, the big one is most likely not a transitioned male raptor. She serves the narrative as the main baddie in a film highlighting female empowerment. Sequels confirm males appear differently and serve different roles in the pack, and evidence presented to us in film lays out a timetable that statistically makes her unlikely to have changed gender at all. Although it was never a widespread theory, it nevertheless persists to this day, and I thought was worth examining in detail. Let me know what you think down in the comments. As ever, I ask that you keep things respectful. Like the last Deep Dig, some may find this content triggering somehow, and while I invite constructive criticism or meaningful debate, I won't be entertaining crude, demeaning, or hateful language or rhetoric. Please keep it polite, and please keep it positive. If you enjoyed this video, please headbutt the like button in a bid to catch a late afternoon snack, and also maybe consider subscribing for more thoughtful Jurassic topics. I'm Brian I. this is Jurassic Kingdom. Later, nerds. Scratching nose, scratching nose. Shoot off!